I want to sort of geek out for 20 minutes and talk a little bit about uh, the work that's inspired or, or some of the things that are inspiring the work that we're doing. And it kind of starts with this old video I found on YouTube, and I, I can't remember where I found it, so I, I apologize to the creator. But it's an MRI video of, of a human being who's obviously alive. And, and this type of video really gets me excited because when I look at this, it brings me back to my childhood when I used to think about the human body as a machine, as, as a robot. And, you know, this type of video and imagery, it, it, this movement, it sort of implicates that something is alive. And when we think about biology, we often think about it through the lens of the genome or biochemistry. But when I see this type of movie, I think about, you know, the mechanical forces that we're seeing happen and play out in that body. And, and there's a question that arises that uh, a number of people are asking is, are these mechanical things, stretch, compression, shear, are these just side products of biology, or are they actually regulating all the underlying machinery inside the cell? And this has given rise to this field known as mechanobiology. Um, it's a field in which we're now starting to, I and, and many other groups worldwide, are now starting to elucidate how cells actually sense, respond, and generate their own mechanical forces. And one of the really key important takeaways here is that the underlying machinery of the cell, the biochemistry and the genome, they can be absolutely regulated by these physical things like stretch. Uh, Nature published a, a series of reviews last year, and one of those articles uh, did a really nice job of looking at the process of embryogenesis. So this is a fundamentally important biological process. It's important to every single one of us. And every stage of the development of an embryo can be regulated and controlled through mechanical information. Stiffness in the matrix, mechanical forces, these are tightly coupled into the genome and into the biochemistry. And so, you know, I want to uh, show you a little bit of our work. We've, um, I, again, I and, and others in the field are developing new tools for stretching and, 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 and mechanically stimulating cells. And this, these are lab on chip types of devices that we build for monolayers. We've also been working with micro tissues. It's about the size of a human hair, roughly. Um, and we build these giant arrays of, of devices for both fundamental discoveries and knowledge about what are the underlying mechanisms that allow cells to sense physical things. Uh, but also for uh, drug screening assays and that sort of um, application. And this is a really nice model system that we've been working on uh, the last few years. Uh, the red cells there are healthy epithelial cells, so the sort of sheets that line our organs. And we pepper into that sheet uh, a group of cells we've been engineering that allow us to turn on oncogenes, so cancer genes. Uh, at the same time, they begin to express a green fluorescent protein so we can see them. And what's kind of neat here is that within this epithelial sheet, when we turn on these genes, these cancer cells, they form little microtumors, and they kind of ball up like this. But the second we put that same model into a device that is stretching, right? So all of our epithelial cells and tissues uh, are experiencing stretch as we breathe and we move and uh, our organs shift. As soon as we do this, the phenotype changes completely. These cells become very metastatic, right? So they become very aggressive. They invade under the healthy cells into the underlying matrix. Their behavior completely changes as soon as we introduce stretch. We haven't, there's no gene modification. There's no biochemistry going on here. This is purely a mechanical influence. And this has huge implications for how we understand biology. There's a fundamental link between these things. And we can go beyond just mechanical forces. Something I've been thinking about for quite a long time is how do cells sense shape? If I put cells in a round room versus a square room versus a triangular room, do they know that they're in a, a type of environment that's got a particular shape? And so this is an example of some older work where we took two cell types. We stained one with a green dye, one with a red dye. We mixed them all up, and then we throw them down onto this engineered surface. It's got these grooves. And within four hours, they spontaneously separate. They pattern over long ranges, the scale of inches or centimeters, um, and in three dimensions. Right? So this isn't, again, not, this is not due to some sort of genetic manipulation or biochemical gradient. They're sensing the shape of that grooved surface, and they're separating and spatially patterning over long ranges because of that physical influence. We can also take this work further, and we've been growing embryo bodies, uh, which mimic the sort of inner cell mass of the blastocyst, which is you know, an early stage of our development. Again, stimulating this sort of three-dimensional morphogenesis and patterning with nothing more than shape. So 
biology has evolved, we have evolved over time to uh, develop this really exquisite link uh, between the physicality of the microenvironment and the biochemistry of the microenvironment at the cellular length scale. And really, if you take nothing else away from this talk, I think it's if you look at biology through the lens of the genome or biochemistry only, you actually are missing half the picture. This is really important feedback loop that exists between the physical environment and the genome. And how that exactly plays out is still a very open question. That's what people are working on right now in this field. So I want you to keep that in mind. And now I'm going <laughs> to take a left turn here and, and, uh, and divert your attention to a really fantastic movie. How many of you have seen this movie, Little Shop of Horrors? OK. I, I have to say, I'm a little disappointed by the number of hands that have gone up. Uh, okay, so I'm a professor, so your homework on the plane ride home is to watch this movie. I, this is this, this is very disappointing, guys. Uh, Little Shop is is a terrible science fiction movie, um, but and it's so terrible, it's amazing. So you have to watch it. Uh, you know, this plant is named Audrey Two because Audrey One died, um, and it eats people. The movie doesn't end well for humanity. Um, but when I watch this movie, and when I ask my students to watch this movie, you know, we, 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 want, we use science fiction as a tool, and I think like many of you do, uh, to inspire scientific questions. But when I watch this movie, what I see is something really interesting uh, from a biological perspective. Uh, you've got a plant-like creature here. It's got leaves, chlorophyll, but at the same time, it's got a tongue, a muscle, teeth, these mammalian characteristics. And we started wondering, you know, could we grow this in the lab? Uh, and for my lab, if you don't know me, this is, a, this is a pretty mundane type of question. This is a totally normal question. Um, and so we, we kind of went into it. And the first thing we started to do was to look at, um, oops, sorry, go back one there, uh, to look at the plant tissue up close. So this is an SEM image um, of plant tissue. And what we discover, what we find, are these really interesting shapes in the microenvironment. And these shapes happen to have the same type of length scales of those engineered surfaces that we were working on earlier. And that was kind of cool. And that really got us thinking, you know, can we exploit this? Can we use this to kind of drive tissue f formation and function? So somebody was... Uh, literally eating an apple one day. I mean, when you embark on a project like this, where do you start? Uh, so we stole the apple, uh, we peeled it, and you get at the flesh of the apple. And what we do is we use a process known as decellularization. We strip out all the plant cells, DNA, everything else. What you're left with is just that fibrous part of the plant that gets stuck in your teeth. And this is what apple sa scaffolds look like, these nice porous environments. And we started, well, Let's put some human and animal cells in there. And it turned out to work. <laughs> this is very rare in science sometimes. Uh, it worked right away as these cells started to grow into these environments. And this was kind of goofy. Um, we weren't sure what exactly we would achieve at this point, but it was, it was kind of neat science. And we were just busy growing all sorts of cell types and from different animals and different humans into these environments. And they turned out to be very biocompatible and, and really kind of create what we think of as a new type of biomaterial, a new type of scaffolding. And this brings up thoughts about regenerative medicine and tissue engineering. And there are approaches uh, for this uh, exist and have existed for a long time. We haven't reinvented the wheel here. Um, and, but ideally, you know, these materials, which are often derived from animals or human cadavers or um, expensive polymers, uh, we'd ideally like these materials to be you know, from a sustainable, ethical source. We'd like them to be biocompatible. Once you put them in the body, you'd like blood vessels to grow inside, healthy cells to go inside, and ultimately, you would like these materials to restore function. And I was talking about this work with a good friend of mine, and we, dis we were discussing that, that mouse up there. Does everybody remember the Vacanti ear mouse, the famous ear mouse? Um, and you know, that, that ear is, of course, uh, cartilage derived from animals, and it's been molded. And uh, he was saying, you know, why don't you try and replicate that experiment, but use plants, right? So you just kind of, can you achieve the same thing? So we said, OK, my students go to the grocery store. We buy a bag of apples. We use Canada Fancy Macintosh. Uh, you, we literally hand, at the, in the early days, we were literally hand carving ears, shapes, processing them, growing cells on them. And what you end up with 
our scaffolds and potential implants for regenerating or repairing the human body. And this, is a, uh, this was Apple, and it's now infiltrated with human uh, uh, cells. And so this kind of opens up a lot of possibilities all of a sudden. Uh, we did not expect to go down this route, but uh, here we are. And uh, since I'm at XMed, I wanted to speculate a little bit before going back to, the, to harder science. You know, there's an important element here. We literally went to the grocery store. We bought the materials in the produce aisle, and we handmade body parts. And so I started thinking, well, could a human someday down the road be custom designing their own body? Uh, could, could we do this by commissioning an artist or a designer? And so I thought, let's take the thought experiment further. I commissioned a design company to give me designs for three years. They gave me the base model. We'd looked at, of course, everybody wants the Spock ear. And then they came up with this one that was unexpected, this augmented ear, which was in 3D, is actually designed to suppress or enhance different frequencies. So it would augment your hearing, in theory. And so we took these designs, we machined them, um, and then we create uh, scaffolds like this. And, and this is after eight weeks in culture with human uh, type, different types of cells. And uh, you can see it's got this sort of flesh-like uh, um, physicality. And really, the next step here is, well, to just install it. So on the way here, <laughs> now, I, I'm not planning to do that today. Um, but, you know, on the, on the way here, I was watching another sci-fi movie, Annihilation, and I won't give away the story here, but there's this really interesting scene where um, this plant vine starts to grow out of somebody's arm. And this raises a really interesting question. You know, are these materials, it's all well and good, we can do this in a lab, but are these materials actually safe in the body or in the animal? So can we do this experiment, put the apple in the mouse? Um, I think most of you will be okay. I'm going to show you a dissection image, um, so just trigger warning there. Um, on the right side, uh, so what we do is a subcutaneous implant just under the back, uh, under the skin on the back of the mouse, leave it in the material for about eight weeks. This is, yeah, this is eight weeks post-op. Uh, we resect, and you can see just at the top right there, there's one of our materials, and you can see these blood vessels growing into it, and that's really important. Compare that to the left side where we don't have any material. And we can do the histology, and if you're interested, there's some papers, you can look at the full uh, staining that we've done. But the real takeaway here is that when we look closely, we've got healthy cells invading this matrix, you've got new healthy collagen being put down, and we have blood vessels growing inside of this thing. This thing is becoming a living part of the body, and it used to be an apple. And we did this by going to the grocery store. And I just want to emphasize, there's no stem cells involved in this, there's no you know, exotic proteins and growth factors being uh, coated onto these materials. We're taking just a very simple, elegant approach and using what we're actually doing here is exploiting the physical structure of the plant. We're matching it to the tissue we're trying to regenerate. So now we're sort of focused on three big areas, uh, three main areas. One is sort of soft tissue, cartilage. Uh, we're working on bone right now, and that's actually living bone that's been uh, grown in the lab. And uh, we're actually taking on a really challenging project of spinal cord repair and nerve repair uh, using these types of scaffolds. Um, recognizing sort of the importance of this, uh, a few years ago we, we put together a team, and, and we're actually translating this work out of the academic lab now and, and into actually the clinical space. Um, and it's becoming real uh, as we speak. Uh, and that's, <laughs> for me, <laughs> so surprising because this started with Little Shop of Horrors. And, and now here we are identifying some real application areas where we can, I think we can have uh, some impact and do some good. So we've gotten a lot of attention for this work. Um, there's been some dubious uh, <laughs> uh, headlines along the way. But also some really interesting questions have arisen, which are, you know, and one of them is, uh, are plants the future of regenerative medicine? I think it'd be irresponsible for me to claim that they are, but I do think plant cellulose is a type of material that's been overlooked. In the early days of this work, we were breaking all sorts of dogma within the tissue engineering uh, industry and, and, and certainly faced a lot of criticism. Uh, but over the years, through publications and data, and now that labs are re producing our work and, and taking it in new directions. What we're seeing is that this material is really effective in many, many applications and, and in many ways kind of ticks the boxes for what we want in an ideal biomaterial. And that's really exciting. It's really exciting to see these kind of wild ideas translate this way. So, you know, just going back to this image, 20 years ago as a grad student starting at UCLA, 
And, uh, you know, there were very few people thinking about mechanobiology at the time. Uh, you know, I could count them on one hand almost. Um, and it's amazing to see how these concepts we were developing, uh, I and many others have been developing, uh, are, are now actually appearing in real-world applications. And we're seeing how we can use those lessons, that fundamental knowledge is now being applied uh, to real problems. So, you know, with that, I just want to sort of wrap up here and just, you know, reflect on the fact that I've been incredibly fortunate over the years to work with just an incredible team of students and staff. Uh, and, you know, one of the things I've been fostering in my lab is an environment where people, are, I demand of everybody around me that they pursue their curiosity, even if it's just this wild idea like creating Audrey 2 in the lab. And, you know, I think everybody in this room appreciates why this is so important, why science fiction is so important. But the point I want to emphasize is the strength of our work and, and the strength of actually blue sky thinking is actually coupling it to the rigor of the scientific method. It's this really positive tension that exists between hyper creativity and rigor that becomes the engine of my lab. And this is how we've generated knowledge. This is the vehicle through which we've created discoveries and inventions and ultimately how we've been solving problems. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, incredible work. Um, one of the things I think you closed with, but I want to sort of zoom out there a bit more. Yeah. We've got a lot of folks who have labs, clinics, are innovating, chief innovation officers. Your lab is an example of this convergence of different mindsets. Any yeah. kind of lessons you've learned in building your team that can help others think about how do you bring these sort of fields together to, to get out of the box, out of the plant? <laughs> uh, you know, I think we know these things. Diversity matters. So my lab is full of artists, scientists, social scientists, you name it. It's an open door. And really, I, I have very few demands. There's two of them. Be curious, apply rigor, and that's it. And as a scientist, you know, if we're not doing reproducible work, there's no point in me existing. So, and when you bring this sort of, you put that boundary condition, but then you let everything kind of go. Uh, the team... Uh, goes in all sorts of directions. And, and one of the things that I think is really important, because everybody's trying to build innovative teams, and it takes time. It's culture that you're building. And culture does not happen overnight. It does not happen after one workshop. You have to foster it and care for it. It took me 10 years to get us to the point where I feel like my team does this instinctually. And uh, failing and working on wild projects is really important, too, because it's like exercise, right? Uh, my teams work on all sorts of weird projects. Most of them go nowhere. Uh, we do it again and again and again, and we fail. But when something like this comes along and it works, the team is poised. They are just so highly trained at that point to execute, execute through the method of the, the scientific method. And that's, that's what's powerful here. So be able to execute, but also be curious, be open, and, and, and almost impro improvise. Absolutely. So improvise. I think a lot of, um, <laughs> even more in the corporate world, there's these 10-year plans and yeah. not adapt. Yep. I can't stand those things. I don't know where I'm going to be in 10 years. I have no idea. But I do know that I'll be constantly curious and asking questions. Right. Yeah. Stay curious. Thank you. Thank so you, much. Man. Thank you.